I'm actually I'm thrilled to be here. Um, for those of you that follow my work, you know that I'm a huge, I'm a huge fan of what happens here at University of Mary Washington. I say nice things about your school all the time to people when I talk. So it's actually great to be able to actually come and spend some time in classrooms today and talk to students. Um, but I think the talk I'm going to deliver is probably not such a nice thing, not about you, hopefully. Um, hopefully when I talk about other people, um, you are not involved. Um, this is actually the last public talk, I, I hope, I think, um, that I'm giving this year. And I'm, I'm uh, interestingly, it was one of the most difficult for me to prepare. I mean, I put a lot of myself, right, my ideas, obviously, my anecdotes from my life, um, into my talk. So when I was asked to speak about gender and technology, um, it was sort of strange to find myself at a loss of how much of me I really wanted to put into the, into the talk tonight, how much I wanted to include, how much of others' experiences I felt comfortable about um, invoking as well, particularly at this, at this moment um, online. I have lots to say, um, don't get me wrong, I have um, personal experiences as being a woman that works in technology. I have a women's studies degree, right? I'm actually officially sanctioned to talk about gender, I think. Um, but to speak about this right now, at this particular moment, right, in person, whether online or offline, to commit these thoughts to writing, to take a stand and to say what's going on is wrong, um, it's a little intimidating at the moment, partially because when you say this word three times, a monster appears, right? Just like Beetlejuice. Right. I'm not even going to repeat it three times because that's how frightening it is. No, I'm kidding. It's not. They're not frightening. Um, but there is this fallout right now online for women in particular around Gamergate and around what this past week is now called Shirtgate um, that are really wreaking havoc, wreaking havoc on people's lives. And I think I'm pretty fierce and fearless. Um, but I have to admit, like I sort of stared at the blinking cursor, trying to figure out what I should say, um, and feeling sort of a little apprehensive about the reaction um, to, what, to what I would say. Particularly sort of if I call out certain isms, if I name certain names, then you know, the, monster, the monster appears. Um, but I have to say it, right? I have to say it because so few people in education technology actually will. And that is that there's a problem with computer technology, right? There's a problem culturally and ideologically. There's a problem with the internet. Um, it's largely designed by men from the developed world, for men for the, of the developed world, right? Men of science, men of industry, right? Military men, venture capitalists, despite the hope and the hype that, um, that these tools were going to sort of have be revolutionary, that they were going to provide access and opportunity to everyone, they don't, right? And they actually don't negate hierarchy, they don't negate history, they don't dismantle power, they don't dismantle privilege, right? In some ways they reflect those. They actually channel those, right? They concentrate that power in new ways and in old ways. And it's important, I think, to sort of recognize that um, harassment of women, of people of color, of marginalized groups is really pervasive online. It's a reflection of offline harassment, for sure, right? Um, but there are these mechanics of the internet, right? It's architecture, it's infrastructure, it's culture that can sort of alter and I think even exacerbate what the harassment looks like and the way in which people experience it online as well. And I think for those of us that work in education technology, myself included, those of us that want to advocate for students in particular to use these tools, that's a really bitter pill to swallow, right? That internet technologies are not actually always necessarily generative, right? That they're not always supportive, right? That they can actually be destructive. Um, but I think that this is an education technology issue. This is a technology issue. It's an education issue. It's a societal issue. Certainly it's a political issue. But we can't ignore it, right? And I think that that's precisely what a lot of the people in education technology seem to do. And in my head, I can hear the voice 
and it's certain voices, right, that say, so a response from sort of certain corners of the internet that say, well, that's just your opinion, lady. Um, and it totally is. It totally is my opinion, right? All my work conceivably falls under the headline opinion. I get that. It's my analysis. That's the term I would use. Um, I think it's grounded in research. I think it's grounded in observation. I think it's grounded in my experience, yes. Um, and sometimes I do talk about personal experience narratives when I, when I, when I speak about technology. Um, sometimes as a way to sort of ground my authority in a field in which I do not actually have a formal degree and I'm not formally employed. So, like I said, when I was thinking about what I was going to say today, I sort of recognized that I felt like um, quite vulnerable. Um, and it's not actually an intellectual vulnerability. It's, um, which sometimes I think I feel quite often, like the thing when you're like ready to push publish on a blog post that you wrote, and you're like, maybe that's dumb, right? <laughs> Or maybe I'm totally wrong, or maybe this thing that I think is actually really smart and insightful, someone else made like last week and they wrote about it much more intelligently. Or someone wrote about it two years ago, or five years ago, or a decade ago, and this thing that I've discovered, actually everyone else knows but me, and I'm going to look like an idiot. I get that all the time in my head, that it's imposter syndrome, right? Um, but I'm talking about a different sort of vulnerability, right? If you're familiar with this movie, you should perhaps consider watching it. It's sort of not simply intellectual, but it's psychological, right? And it's physical as well. And that is a reminder that my work comes from a body, right? My body, it's a marked body, right? It's gendered, and therefore it's never seen as objective, right? I'm always subject I, subjective, I always have an opinion. It's gendered, right? That's the lens through which I write. That is how I experience the world, right? A white heterosexual American female, and that is how I experience the internet. So there's a very famous New Yorker cartoon, perhaps you're familiar with, that on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. The, the cartoon was first published in 1993, which is really interesting because it sort of marks that already in the early 90s, that the notion of the internet was popular enough that, well, that readers of The New Yorker could joke about it. So make of that what you will. <laughs> but, um, but, but it also is sort of shows to us that for a very long time now, we've had this idea that the internet provides us with privacy and anonymity. And it allows us to be this place where we can experiment with our identities online, right? In ways that are severed from our body, right? From our material selves and potentially at least we can sort of participate on the internet in ways that we can't actually in the offline world, right? That dog is able to do things on the internet that he wouldn't be able to do offline, perhaps. But I think that there's that moment, right, when folks on the internet discover that you're a dog, right? And they do everything in their power to put you back in your place, to remind you that you have a body, to punish you for being there, to punish you for speaking, to hurt you, to destroy you, right? And it's online and it's offline. So the following sentence I'm going to say is so weird. And when I utter it, it's like it sounds, it sounds strange for me to even say it. But I've received death threats. Like I write about education technology for a living. I write online and I've received death threats. I've had people respond to my work by saying I, they wanted to kill me, they wanted me to die, right? I've had death threats, rape threats, um, subtle and overt. Most of the time I get what my friend uh, Tressie McMillan Cottom describes as who the fuck do you think you are comments, right? Those are people that suggest that I should shut up, right? I've been harassed, I've been threatened, some is sporadic, some is serial. In response, I've taken the comments off my blog, which means then they email me the threats. It happens on platforms like Twitter and Facebook and Google. So I block, I delete, I flag as spam. But it's up to me to monitor this, right? It becomes, of the, it becomes part of the work that I have to do um, to do my work 
online. I've filed complaints, I've filed reports to the social media platforms, but rarely do they respond. When I tell people that these are my experiences, they often say like, well, are the threats real? Um, and that's a hard question <laughs> to answer because, yeah, nobody has come knocking at my door, thankfully, right? But they're real. They are real. I experience these threats as real. Right? Even if nobody physically hurts me, these threats are very material. They take a toll on me, right? They affect my work, my mental health, my physical health, my relationship with my partner. They affect my life. Um, so for a long time, I wondered, like, what is it about me that's so controversial? I mean, I'm a nice person. I sometimes say things that are a little, little sharp-edged, but what is it about me? And, like, I hear that, actually, from helpful men on the Internet that tell me that if I would just sort of soften it up, right, that I wouldn't be treated this way, right? If I would say more nice things, right, if I would smile. That's why I have that shark face, that big shark smile in my avatar on Twitter. And it's true, like I said, my work is sometimes critical, sometimes bitingly so. Um, but you know, I've come to realize that these threats, the threats and the harassment are not at their core about the content of what I write. They're not about the substance of any of my arguments. My arguments are pretty, they're pretty good. Um, they're not actually about tech or ed tech or God forbid ethics in video game journalism, right? They are because I'm quite simply a woman, right? I'm a woman who expresses opinion on the internet, right? I'm, I'm a woman. One of my very favorite essays is by the writer Rebecca Solnit, um, Men Explain Things to Me. It's the inspiration for for the title of this talk. She wrote this essay first in 2008, and since then the word, the term mansplaining has become really popular and widely used. We often use it to describe this experience, right, where on the internet where men explain things to women. Um, she actually published a whole book on the topic earlier this year. Mansplaining is what I would call a microaggression, right? It's a practice of undermining women's intelligence, their contributions, their voice, their experiences, their knowledge, their expertise. And frankly, once these pile up, these sort of mansplaining microaggressions, they really do un begin to undermine a woman's feelings of self-worth. And then I think, and the purpose is, women choose not to speak. I'm going to quote from her essay at length, partially because it's so marvelous. Um, so she says, I was in Berlin giving a talk when the Marxist writer Tariq Ali invited me out to dinner that included a male writer and translator and three women a little younger than me who would remain deferential and mostly, mostly silent throughout the dinner. Tariq was great. Perhaps the translator was peeved that I insisted on playing a modest role in the conversation. But when I said something about how women strike for peace, the extraordinary little-known anti-nuclear and anti-war group founded in 1961 had helped to bring down the Communist Hunting House Committee on Un-American Activities, or HUAC, Mr. Very Important II sneered at me. Right. HUAC, he insisted, didn't in exist by the early 1960s, and anyway, no women's group played such a role in HUAC's downfall. His scorn was so withering, his confidence so aggressive, that arguing with him seemed a scary exercise in futility and an invitation to more insult. I think I'd written nine books at that point, including one that actually drew on primary documents and interviews about women's strike for peace. But explaining men still assume that I am in some sort of obscene impregnation metaphor, an empty vessel to be filled with their wisdom and knowledge. A Freudian would claim to know what they have and I lack. But intelligence is not situated in the crotch, even if you can write one of Virginia Woolf's long, mellifluous musical sentences about the subtle subjugation of women in the snow with your willy. Back in my hotel room, I googled a bit, 
and found that Eric Bentley in his definitive history of the House Committee on American Activities credits women's strike for peace with, quote, quote, striking the crucial blow in the fall of Huac's Bastille in the early 1960s. So I open an essay for the nation with this, inter with this interchange in part as a shout out to one of the more unpleasant, unpleasant men who have explained things to me. Dude, if you're reading this, you're a carbuncle on the face of humanity and an obstacle to civilization. Feel the shame. The battle with men who explain things has trampled down many women of my generation, of the up and coming generation that we need so badly, here and in Pakistan and Bolivia and Java, not to speak of the countless women who came before me and who were not allowed into the laboratory or the library or the conversation or the revolution or even the category human. After all, Women's Strike Work for Peace was founded by women who were very tired of making the coffee and doing the typing and not having any voice or decision-making role in the anti-nuclear movement of the 1950s. Most women fight wars on two fronts, one for whatever the putative topic is and one simply for the right to speak, to have ideas, to be acknowledged, to be in possession of facts and truths, to have value, to be a human being. Things certainly have gotten better, but this war won't end in my lifetime. I'm still fighting it, for me, for, my, for myself certainly, but also for all those younger women who have something to say in the hope that they will get to say it. Rebecca Solnit, awesome, awesome writer. I think thanks to feminism, right, thanks to feminist pedagogy, sometimes we can, we can recognize when these incidents of mansplaining occur in academia, and oh my, they do occur in academia, right? Or when they occur in the classroom, right? We can see what happens when a young woman or a person of color perhaps some, has something terrifically smart to say, right? Whether it's based on their research, their analysis, their personal experience, and a man will interrupt and interject and explain whatever the topic is more loudly to them. Explain their personal experiences back to them. More forcefully with all the assuredness, right? And all of that well actually, um, that comes with male privilege. I hope, I hope that as educators, we try to sort of elevate the marginalized voices in our classroom, but online, we don't do that very well. I think the mansplaining is actually pretty overwhelming. And I speak from experience. I have on Twitter, I have over 26,000 followers, most of whom follow me, I think, maybe, because from time to time, I tend to say smart things about education technology. But regularly, regularly, men, strangers mostly, but not always, jump into my app mentions to explain education technology to me, right? To explain how open source licenses work, or open data, or open education, or MOOCs. Men explain learning management systems to me. Men explain the history of education technology to me. Men explain privacy and education data to me. Men explain venture capital how venture capital works of education startups to me. They explain online harassment to me. That's always my favorite. <laughs> um, men explain how blogging works to me and what it means to be a blogger, right? Men explain, they explain, they explain, and it's exhausting, right? It's exhausting and it's insidious. And it doesn't quite raise to the level of harassment, to be sure, but these microaggressions sort of, they mean that sort of when harassment and threats do happen, like we're already worn down, right? And this is all sort of part of my experiences online, um, women's experiences and, and my friends' experiences. As I was designing the slides and I decided to do different slides because I actually couldn't like come up with um, something directly related to, to this, I thought maybe I would just make a list of all of the women who are my friends, my peers, who've experienced online harassment in the last year or so. So I started to like, you know, run through the names. Adria, Sarah, another Sarah, a different Sarah, Brianna, Shanley, Suey, Tressy, Jesse. Online harassment, right? This is online harassment. Different Julie, Rose, Ariel, Anita, Kathy, Zoe, Amanda, Ash, Catherine, Felicia, Mickey, Mia, Molly, Lauren, Jen, a different Jen, another Jen, Jessica, Jesse, Jess, Caroline, Katie, Sadie, Bridget, Alyssa, Lindy, Rebecca, Roxanne. I could go on. I could go on. 
I should be clear, for many of these women too, for this harassment has moved offline as well. They've been doxxed, for example. That's where your address and um, phone number and other identifiable, inf identifiable information about your physical world is posted offline I'm in forums like 4chan for the specific purpose of offline harassment. So take the actress Felicia Day, for example, who recently posted her thoughts about Gamergate. Um, what's become this ongoing campaign, right, of harassment against women in gaming. She said, I've tried to retweet a few of the articles I've seen dissecting the issue in support, but personally, I am terrified to be doxxed for even typing the words Gamergate. She said, I've had stalkers and restraining orders issued in the past. I've had people show up at my doorstep when my personal information was hard to get. To have my location revealed to the world would give an entry point for a few mentally ill people who have fixated on me and allow them to show up and make good on the kinds of threats that I've received that make me paranoid to walk around a convention alone. I haven't been able to stomach the risk of being afraid to get out of my car in my own driveway because I have expressed an opinion that someone on the internet did not agree with. How sick is that, she said. Almost instantly after she posted this, almost instantly, she was doxxed, right? Her physical address was posted online. Almost instantly. And that's how increasingly how it works. You disagree with someone online and you're doxxed. Um, for many of these women, and myself included, our profession, our work actually demands we be online, right? We're writers and we're artists and journalists and actors and speakers and educators and students, right? We cannot not be online. And I think it's easy for some people to, to suggest that many of us are targeted because we have a higher profile, right? And we are, I think, maybe, perhaps, somewhat more easily recognizable, perhaps, but that's beside the point. Because one of the things that comes with being internet famous, which, yay, internet famous, um, is that, you know, as a higher profile internet user, you actually then start to have more powerful connections to people at, say, Twitter or Tumblr, so that when something happens to you, your complaints are elevated and dealt with the c accounts that attacked you perhaps are shut down, um, and your harassers are sort of addressed more rapidly than what user, regular users will ever experience. And regular users do indeed experience online harassment. The Pew Research Internet Project recently published the results from a survey of online harassment. Among the findings, 60% of internet users say they've witnessed someone being called an offensive name. Um, 53 percent have seen efforts to purposefully embarrass someone, 25 percent say they had seen someone being physically threatened, 25 percent, one in four, so right, 24 percent have witnessed someone being harassed for a sustained period of time, 19 percent say they witnessed someone being sexually harassed, 18 percent they had sent, 18 percent say they had witnessed someone being stalked. According to that same survey, 22% of all users, internet users, say that they have been harassed. One in five. Right? About half of those, a little over half of those, say they were the less severe forms of harassment. But 45% say that they have experienced the more severe, the more severe forms, right? Serial harassment, sexual harassment, stalking. Young women, those age 18 to 24, what we still sort of label as college age, they experience the most severe forms of harassment online. 26% of young women online say they have been stalked. 25% say they have been the targets of online sexual harassment. And again, this, the, the information in this Pew survey is self-reported, so I think we can sort of question perhaps what that means. And so when, they, when, the Pew, when Pew says, men are somewhat more likely than women to experience harassment. I think we should probably remember that the harassment that men and women experience online is very different in degree and in purpose and intended results. A different organization, um, the Working to Halt Abuse Online, has found that 73% of cyber stalking victims are women. A University of Maryland study, a research project created fake accounts 
um, sent them into internet chat rooms. The ones with feminine usernames incurred an average of 100 sexually explicit threats in a day. The ones that had masculine names, three. So again, I think I want to make this link back to our bodies, our offline bodies, because an earlier Pew survey said too that 5% of women who use the internet say that something happened to them online that led them to feel physical, led them into physical danger. And again, the World Health Organization reminds us that violence against women is widespread around the world. 35% of women worldwide have experienced either intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. Women who've been physically and sexually abused have higher rates of mental health issues, unintended pregnancies, abortions, miscarriages than non-abused women. Increasingly, in many conflicts, sexual violence is used as a tactic of war. So we, don't expect, we do not escape our bodies when we go online. Right? As much as that New Yorker cartoon suggests we might. In fact, I want to argue that computer technologies online, the internet, they actually reinscribe our bodies in ways I don't think we often talk about. Sort of the power and the ideology of gender and race and sexual um, orientation and national identity, in part because of who is building these tools. So for a couple of years now, news organizations have been trying to get the major technology companies to say who works for them. What does your workforce look like? And in fact, many of these companies have fought, have fought attempts to publish their EEO, the Equal Employment Opportunity Data. You're required by law to report this data. Um, this year, perhaps recognizing that at some point, the technology companies are going to have to talk about the pipeline issue, um, how they're going to get more women and people of color into the STEM fields. Some of the major tech companies have released the data about who works for them, and it is not pretty. 70% of Google's employees are male, 61% are white, 30% are Asian. Of Google's technical employees, 83% are male, 60% of those are white, and 34% of those are Asian. 70% of Apple's employees are male, 55% are white, 15% are Asian, 80% of Apple's technical employees are male, 69% of Facebook's employees are male, 57% are white, 34% are Asian. Do the math on that one. 85% right. of Facebook's technical employees are male. 70% of Twitter employees are male. 59% are white, 29% are Asian. 90% of Twitter's engineers are male. So I wonder, gee, I wonder why viol blocking violent harassers, reporting rape threats, banning sock puppet accounts, and so on hasn't been a priority for the engineering team. And I wonder too, I, I, I'm genuinely curious what the demographics look like for education technology companies, right? What percentage of those who are building the ed tech software that we use are, are men? What percentage of them are white? What percentage of the engineers that work at the learning management system companies, for example, are men? How do these bodies shape what gets built? Right? How do the privileges and ideologies, expectations and values get hard-coded into the technology we use? You know, I think we view education as a female profession. Certainly at the K through 12 level, three quarters of teachers are women over 80% are white, which is, it's worth pointing out that this year for the first year, um, minority students actually out, nor minority, I have to put, well, minority students outnumber white students in public schools. 80% of teachers are white. The higher education level, um, less than half of college instructors are women, again, overwhelmingly white. But I think it's still a mistake to talk about education as a female dominated profession, right? That, um, women aren't necessarily well represented in leadership roles in education, in decision-making roles. Um, and I think we have to talk about the ways in which women do experience work-related harassment in the education field, right? Um, and then recognize, once we add that to technology to that, that the picture somewhat gets worse. Again, what percentage of education technologists are men? 
what percentage of education technology leaders are men, what percentage of education technology consultants, those who make a living traveling, talking about education technology, what percentage of education CIOs and CTOs, what percentage of ed tech CEOs. Again, these bodies, like I said, their privileges, their ideologies, their expectations, their values, how do they influence the technology that gets built? Um, so I'm speaking to a group of students and educators here. So like, I think that means I'm supposed to say something like what we can do about this, right? <laughs> right? Well, I mean, we're, like, I'm not supposed to just like leave you all with like, shit, I'm like, what am I going to do? Um, you know, what can we do to resist that hard coding? What can we do actually to subvert it? Um, what can we do to make sure that the technologies that our students, all of us, use really can be wielded in ways that are actually progressive and not horrifyingly awful, right? What can we do to make sure when we say to students, oh, your assignments involves you being online, that we haven't sort of triggered half the classroom with fears of abuse and harassment, um, exposure, death threats. And I think that the answer can't simply be that we can tell women to not use their real name online. Right. Particularly if we're making the argument that participating online means that students and educators are building a digital portfolio or building out their professional network or contributing to scholarship, then we have to really think about whether saying use a pseudonym is a sufficient or equitable response. And I think we can't say, well, just don't blog on the internet. Or, keep everything within the safety of the walled garden, right? Just do it all inside the learning management system. If nothing else, I think that this presumes that what happens inside siloed online spaces is somehow safe. I've seen plenty of really horrible behavior on closed forums from professors and from students alike. I've seen really heavy-handed moderation where questioning voices and marginalized voices are deleted. Right. Um, I've seen forums where there's zero moderation and questioning voices and marginalized voices are mobbed. So the and the answer can't really be